Hello again. I have to say, I have to apologise to you for, for a few things. Blah, 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 blah. Um, that first uh, passage that I wrote, read was called The Introduction, not Chapter 1. <laughs> I'm so excited about this, I can hardly contain myself, so I'm making lots of faux pas. But I'm sure you can relate to that because none of us is perfect. So I'm actually going to read Chapter 1 now, which is called A Crack in the Prison Door. Okay, we start this with a story, actually. So it says, There once was a prince who lived in a grand palace. It was filled with treasures from every corner of the earth. Persian rugs, French tapestries, hand-carved tables, and the finest paintings from Europe and Asia. Its rooms overflowed with silver platters of fruits, orchids, and banquets of exotic flowers. But there was a problem. Shutters were fastened across every window. Not a single ray of sunlight penetrated, and the palace lay in darkness. The problem was that the prince was oblivious to the abundance surrounding him. One day a servant plucked up the courage to ask the prince why he inhabited a palace. As dark as the blackest night, and the prince was stunned. He had no idea there was an alternative. Joyfully, the servant opened the palace shutters for the first time, and suddenly the prince could see beauty and abundance everywhere. They had been within reach all along. He simply had been unable to see them. So, like the shutters in this story, there is a crack in our prison door. We don't know how it, got, how it got there, but it changes everything. Sunlight floods the darkness and images of an immensely joyful world dance on the walls. Suddenly, we realise the prison is not really the world, as we've been led to believe. It is merely a prison. A prison with high-speed internet access, perhaps, but a prison nevertheless. Whose walls are suffering and whose gates are dead? So over on this page we've got a um, diagram with a square with the word you inside the square. We're boxed in, in other words. And then around that is a dotted circle, dash dashes, you know, a circle that's not um, a complete line. And we have little pointers. The pointer to the box says prison wall, desire to re receive for the self alone. And there's a dotted line going to the circle, the dashed circle, and the word next to that is God. So we have a box that we're inside and a surrounding circle, which is God. The crack in the door challenges us to a merciless assessment of our situation. The R-rated version, not the PG version. We must realise that this life is a prison. Rather than generating despair, such an evaluation is actually an assertion of freedom and hope. Vanishing in time, destined to die, clinging to an illusion of separateness from God, these are the ultimate sources of desperation. Replacing them requires a decision, crossing the line. It's as if we were here in a destructive, unhealthy situation, a demeaning love relationship, or in an unfulfilling job. And after all the denials and rationalizations, we're struck by a moment of clarity and it suddenly pops. There's no more balance sheet, no more judicious weighing of the various pros and cons. We just leave because we know we have to. That is the fierceness of the commitment necessary to vacate this existence of pain and suffering and return to a world of joy. The journey to becoming like God must become more than an intriguing idea. It must become a realisation that enters ourselves with the force of destiny. A realisation that seamless union with God, where God's thoughts become our thoughts, God's actions our actions, God's intentions our intentions, is a natural process, not a religious conversion. It is a transformation taking place in an invisible place in our souls as natural as a seed becoming an oak tree, and it has nothing to do with faith, morality, or earning heaven on the basis of good behaviour. It is a transformation born of the most ancient science of truth of all, Kabbalah. And Kabbalah is not religion, but rather technology. Technology that predates religion. 
question becomes why, if escape is such a natural process, is it a road so untravelled? Why have so few in history succeeded in breaking free of these prison walls? The answer is that the path of escape leads past the ultimate prison guard. The negative force ancient texts refer to as desire to receive for the self alone. It is a force programmed into the atoms of physical nature that opposes every effort we make to change. So from this moment on, I will give this force a name, the opponent. Unless we understand the insidious nature of the opponent, there is no hope of escape. The opponent comes dressed in the clothes of a friend rather than the uniform of a guard and then betrays us endlessly to our captors. Even worse, the opponent convinces us that he is us. What we call life is a vast case of mistaken identity and until we dis distinguish our identity from the opponents, we will remain imprisoned. It's a good point. So this is getting interesting. So let's begin a journey on a highway of transformation driven by revulsion for the opponent, a journey conducted endlessly, relentlessly and joyfully, asking ourselves at each moment, is this choice moving me closer or further from God? Of course the mind will say, this is just a book, it can't be serious. What chance do I have of remembering this godly nature I suppose, supposedly possess every time I make a decision? How could I scale walls so few before, we, before me have ever scaled? The opponent is pleased you feel that way. But the Wright brothers didn't feel that way, nor did Leonardo da Vinci. At each shift of the paradigm, the impossible presents its impeccable credentials, is overruled and the unthinkable becomes the norm. And now another seismic shift has occurred. We have the fortune to be alive for the most extraordinary moment in the history of human consciousness. It is a time when what was once absurd will become commonplace. It's now possible for large numbers of people to escape the prison of pain, suffering and death, and by doing so, they'll form a critical mass that will change the world for everyone else. Now, it's just a matter of mechanics. With what tiny blunt instru instrument will we chip away at the walls of the dungeon, day after day, year after year, until the day we breathe in sunlight? We'll get there. What hope do we have against the insidious, shape-shifting guard who stands at the prison gate? We'll get there. This book is an invitation to a journey, a supreme journey, from prisoner to God. It is extended to you courtesy of a crack in the door that has just opened up in this era in which we happen to be fortunate enough to live. Are you interested? I hope so. So, chapter two. God disguised as you. The guard of the prison gate is utterly ruthless. Brutal treatment of prisoners has proceeded for millennia. So now the prisoners are beaten, hopeless, huddling on their cots, staring out through the bars of their cells. A good day is simply one endured without pain. The guard, the opponent, has convinced his prisoners that we're small and insignificant, when in truth, whatever our wildest dreams of accomplishment may be, they only scratch the surface of what is possible. The truth is, we are destined to become like God, but have been tricked into becoming inmates, posing as ants, indifferent to the ghastly spread between what we are and what we could be. We bounce back and forth between actions and reactions. We could be infinite, and until we begin to realise that potential, we will lie listless on our prison bed cells. Cots. Beds. <laughs> According to the Bible, man was created in God's image. In God's image, man was created. Kabbalah teaches us that there are no superfluous words in the Bible, so why the repetition? It urges the reader to pay attention. Do not miss this. You are created in God's image. So I'm going to read that little quote again. Man was created in God's image. In God's image, man was created. You have the same essence and therefore the same potential as God. You are destined to become like God, so keep asking yourself, am I like God yet? Am I manifesting godly powers? Can I heal the sick and bless people? Have I resurrected the dead? The yardstick suddenly extends to infinity. 
I don't just measure myself against myself. I measure myself against God. So now let's look at the box again. There's a box and inside that box is you and around the outside is the dotted line, circle. So the, again the words pointing to the box are desire to receive for self alone. And then the dotted circle outside, the words are not just the word God but your God potential. So your surrounding energy is your God potential. This is our potential, whoever we are, whatever our impediments, real or imagined. Moses was physically frail and spoke with a lisp. Greatness is not reserved for the great. The great are simply those who have risen to meet their destiny. Everyone alive has a destiny infinitely richer than they know. Dullness and boredom come from the unmet or abandoned potential. It's television ratings soaring. It's playing computer games when you are meant to compose sonatas. If you're not doing what you were meant to do, the each, and each person was meant for something astonishing, you'll never enjoy contentment. Imagine Dr. Jonas Salk becoming a successful businessman, a generous citizen, and a wonderful father, but never going near a lab. What may have seemed a good life would in fact have been tragic. The pain and suffering he was meant to remove from the world never having been achieved. A great spiritual leader with thousands of students and many books to his credit once told this story. When I was 11, he said, I was a lost cause as a student. I never minded my teachers and I played hooky from school at every opportunity. Then one evening I heard my parents in the next room talking about me. My mother was crying. What are we going to do with our son? She said to my father. He has no interest in his studies, he doesn't want to go to school, and any day now they will expel him, then what will become of him? As I listened to her, a strange event occurred. I could feel her anguish as acutely as if it had been my own. I burst into the room and I told her I was sorry. I promised that I would be a good student and obedient from that moment on. I made the promise not because I cared about studying, but because I cared about my mother and did not want to cause her pain. I kept my word and changed my ways. I became studious and never missed a day of school and I grew up, grew up to be a scholar you see before you now. My point is this, if I, had not, if I had not overheard my parents that day, what would have become of me? Well, I would have been a good person since it was in my nature to do so. I would have prayed, I would have given to charity, I would have enabled many others to earn a good living. However, imagine what would have happened if after I left this world and arrived in the place called the heavenly court, my judges would say, where are your thousands of students? I would gape at them and reply, what are you talking about? I was a merchant and I did good business, but I didn't have any information to impart to even a handful of students let alone thousands. Let's talk instead about the sums of money that I gave to charity. And then they would say, where are the dozens of books you were supposed to write? Again, I'd look at them as if they were unhinged. What do you mean, dozens of books? I wasn't illiterate. I could read and write, but I had no reason to write any books. I had nothing to teach anyone. Let's talk instead about the many kindnesses I bestowed on my friends, my family and my customers. Then they would show me everything I could have achieved, everything I should have done. Can you imagine the grief I would feel in that moment? There is no greater hell than to see what we might have done but in fact failed to do. So this is the measure. Where am I? Not in reference to others but in reference to myself. Where am I on the road of my own potential? Growth should not be linear, but exponential. A little growth increases our feeling of contentment exponentially, and every step makes the next one easier. If our thoughts and actions are not taking us toward God, we need to change. What progress are we making? That cannot be quantified by anyone outside ourselves. We need to ask ourselves this. If we continue in our life's trajectory for 5, 10 or 20 years, where will we be? Will we become like God yet? 
The answer should make us rethink our efforts. As we dissolve our prison chains and merge our essence back into God's essence, we reveal our godly nature more and more. Eventually, we may become immortal and even, res even resurrect the dead. It is this vision we keep before us, immovably. Until then, the opponent will do his job as supreme prison guard of the penitentiary we inhabit and chief operating officer of our universal system of pain and suffering. His job is to ensure that we don't realise our potential, yet if we could even believe for a minute who we really were and how great our destiny, the balance would shift and we would emerge from prison, not like inmates, but like God. The world in the balance. <clears throat> we are trapped in a paradigm of insignificance. What we say doesn't matter. What we do has no effect. We are isolated, separate, finite. We are rocks. Realising our potential shatters the paradigm of insignificance and leads to a further realisation. Everything matters. Everything counts. Everything affects everything else. The opponent has us convinced of our powerlessness when with every action the world stands in the balance and we are tipping the scales. If we commit a negative action today, someone halfway around the world may receive the negative energy our action released into the universe. In turn, he will be tipped toward doing something negative and the negativity will grow exponentially. Ultimately, it will become ultimately it will come back to the person who originated it. In the time of the great Kabbalist Rav Isaac Luria, there lived an eminent sage and scholar named Rav Yosef Karo. Once after weeks of meditation on a difficult passage of the Bible, Rav Karo penetrated its deepest meaning. Delighted, he posed the question to a student, expecting the student would appreciate his master's explanation. To his surprise, the student immediately saw the answer. Rav Karo could not believe that what had taken him weeks of intense study to uncover had taken the student a few minutes. Despondent, he began questioning himself. Perhaps he had been given too much credit. Perhaps he should give up teaching. He wandered the streets and encountered the eminent Rav Luria, who asked him why he looked so downcast. After listening patiently, Luria spoke. There was a village whose water came from a spring at the top of a mountain. Few villagers had the strength to walk to the top, so it was one man's job to fetch water for the entire village. It took him many hours to fill the huge buckets. When he did, everyone came and filled their little cups from these buckets, which of course took only minutes. Even the weakest of them had no trouble. What I am saying is that your weeks of work opened up a channel of understanding. Once the channel was open, it was simple for your student to also understand. What we think and what we do enters the global consciousness and changes it. According to Rav Ashlag, every time a person removes even a fragment of the desire to receive for the self alone, the increase in consciousness accrues to the global soul. For time, for, uh, sorry, each time one of us reveals more of his or her godly nature, it influences the collective being. As you become like God, it becomes easier for someone else to become like God. The world hangs in the balance. Mm, we're pretty powerful people, aren't we? Because we're like God. So, we'll go on to chapter 3. Chapter 3, Certainty. During the nine months we spend in our mother's womb, an angel holds a candle for us, teaching us the wisdom of the universe. We behold everything, from the beginning of the world to the end of the world. When we're born, the angel gives us a sharp blow on the upper lip and it makes us forget everything we've learned. Yet memory traces remain in our souls. The idea of God resonates with us and it is on this resonance, on this residual memories, that we build our consciousness. See the little spot here? That's where the angel taps in. So say thank you to that little angel. That's a lot to remember and a lot to forget and it's a lot to be separate from. We enter the physical world, ourselves forgotten, but somewhere in our souls we remember something, the potential to become like God stirs. These memories are the basis for what capitalists, capitalists call certainty. Certainty, according to the Zohar, is one of the secrets to activating our godly nature. 
certainty, not only that we can achieve it, but that we will achieve it. <coughs> certainty is a vessel. According to Kabbalah, in order for the light of the Creator to be revealed, there must be a vessel to receive it. The name of that vessel is certainty, and the, light of, the level of light revealed depends on the strength of that certainty. The Zohar states that there is never a time when there is no light. It is only the vessel that limits the amount of light manifested. When we achieve total certainty, we become like God. So, how strong is our vessel or certainty? That determines whether, you know, how, how, how we're becoming like God. So, I'm certain I'm going to get through this book, but whether you're going to enjoy the way I'm reading it or not is another matter. Okay, have certainty, we will get there. The opponent is anti-certainty. The opponent is the sower of doubt, the restrictor of the vessel. In the opponent's paradigm of insignificance, we don't become like God because we believe we can't become like God. So we have a story here. The Bible tells the story of a woman from Shunam who cared for Elisha, the prophet. You've taken such good care of me, Elisha told the woman one day. What shall I do for you? Actually, I think they say Elisha. But anyway. Can I intercede with the king on some matter, or with one of his generals? How might I be of service to you? The Shunamit replied that she was a simple woman with no special requests, but after she had left, Elisha asked aloud, What can I do for this loyal woman? Gahazi, his servant, answered, Master, the Shunamit is an old woman and she has never had a child. Elisha called her back and said to her, You will give birth to a son, specifying the exact day the boy would be born. Astounded, the Shunamit answered, Do not mock me, do not lie to me. But Elisha reassured her calmly that it would come to pass exactly as prophecy. And it did. She gave birth to a baby boy on the precise day of Elisha's prophecy. Years passed and the child grew. One day, while cutting hay in the fields, the boy complained of a headache. His condition worsened and later, while sitting on his mother's lap, he died. The Shunamit carried the boy to the bed where Elisha had slept, or would sleep when he was in town, and laid him on it. She closed the door behind her and went to her husband and said, Send me one of the servants, one of the young ones who work with you, and also one of the donkeys, and let me go to the man of God who is teaching on the edge of town. The husband inquired why she was going to the prophet, since it was neither the first of the month nor the Shabbat. But the Shunamit said simply, Peace be with you, goodbye. She rode to Mount Carmel, where Elisha was teaching, and when the prophet saw her, he asked Gehazi to in inquire about her family. The Shunamit told the servant, <clears throat> that everything was fine. However, when she re reached the place where Elisha stood, she clasped her hands around his legs. Gehazi came to push her away, but the prophet said, Leave her, she is in great pain. God did not let me know this. He did not let me see, and he did not tell me. Through her tears the woman cried, Did I ask for a son from God? I did not. I begged you not to make a fool of me. What kind of favour was it to give me a son who dies at such a young age? Elisha told Gehazi to put on a coat, take Elisha's cane, and go and place it on the child's face. If you come across anyone, Elisha warned him, do not talk about this even if someone blesses you. Don't answer them. The woman stuck close to Gehazi as he headed toward the child, swearing she would not leave his side until he had received her son, or revived her son. However, in spite of Elisha's warning and the Shunamit's protestations, Gehazi mentioned his mission to several acquaintances he encountered. When they reached the child, he put the cane on the boy's face, as Elisha had instructed, but nothing happened. The boy was as still as a rock, without even the flicker of an eyelid. Gehazi and the Shunamit rushed back to Elisha, and the mother began to sob uncontrollably. Elisha put on his coat and made the journey himself back to the house. Elisha closed the bedroom door behind him, prayed to God, and then lay down on top of the child. He put his mouth on the boy's mouth, his eyes on the boy's eyes, and his hands on the boy's hands. Slowly the body of the child became warm. Elisha got up, 
paced around the room for a few moments and then laid down again on the boy. He repeated this procedure seven times and after the seventh time the child opened his eyes. The prophet told Gehazi to call in the Shunammite. She entered the room and upon seeing her son alive she fell to her knees and bowed down to Elisha. Weeping, but now with tears of joy, she lifted up her child and departed. This is the story of the vessel known as Certainty, encrypted with many levels of coded meaning. Why does the woman say goodbye to her husband rather than inform him of the son's death? The answer resides in the technology of certainty. When we don't believe death can be overcome, it will not happen. Lack of certainty closes off the vessel. The Shunamit did not confide in her husband because she knew his level of certainty could not encompass their son returning from the dead. Had she told her husband, the prophet would have not have been unable to perform the miracle. The father would certainly have prayed for his son's resurrection. He would have dearly loved to believe in its possibility, but wanting to believe is not the same as certainty. Good intentions still limit the vessel. Such is the insidious power of doubt. Many consider the Bible the word of God, yet refuse to believe in the possibility of resurrection, even though it is declared in the Bible's pages. This is the opponent at work, sowing his seeds in the fields of pain, suffering and death, convincing us we can't become like God. For the opponent knows the power of certainty awakened, the ultimate knowing of who we are and what we can become like, God. With certainty as a foundation, we can approach what follows, an extraordinary set of statements that will change our lives forever. Chapter 4. The God Formula So, we inhabit a prison, a strange sort of prison to be sure, because most inmates don't even realise we're behind bars. We've even conditioned, we're even conditioned to scoff at the notion that there might actually be another world, a world of joy and light, shining right beyond the prison walls. Then one day, someone hands us an escape plan that includes the layout of the prison and a step-by-step -step plan of escape, a flawless plan. What will we do? What I'm about to reveal is a blueprint to freedom. Of course, we don't literally live inside prison walls, and we're not literally confined to dingy concrete cells, but we are trapped by pain, suffering and death. So in fact, what I'm about to present is an escape plan from the strongest maximum security prison ever built. If that's true, if unlike Club Med, life is not as it should be, if there really is a life of joy and abundance destined for us by the Creator, logic would dictate that the plan I'm about to reveal is more than an interesting piece of advice it's more than another book of positive information about life to read and forget. If this truly is a viable escape plan, logic dictates that this, that this is the most important piece of information that has ever come your way. It should not just be read. It should be seized. It should be studied and memorized or copied and put in your pocket so you can read it on the street or taped or taped to the mirror. So it's the first thing you see when you wake up. Okay, so I'm giving this to you so you can listen to it in the future. This plan involves six statements and what I call the God formula. The six statements that follow serve as an explanation of life as it is and life as it should be. The God formula provides a method for getting from one to the other. It is rigorously logical, yet it is not a product of human reason. It is born of information revealed over millennia to men whose fate it has been to receive such truths and relay them to the rest of us. It is a message from the other side of the wall, a shaft of sunlight pouring through a crack in the prison door. 1. The world is the war of two opposite forces, light and darkness. You're going to see these symbols if you get the book, light and darkness. There is no permanence in the universe. There is only movement. We are either heading toward the light or we're heading for darkness. Through our actions, we choose our direction. Mm. 
That was one. The world is the war of two opposite forces, light and darkness, which is movement. Two. The source of light, better known as God, is the wellspring of all joy, fulfilment and life. The force of darkness, better known as ego, actually I should start that again, two. The source of light, better known as God, is the wellspring of all joy, fulfilment and life. The force of darkness, better known as ego, is the source of of all pain, suffering and death. All the positive things we experience in our lives are manifestations of the light of the Creator. Ego is the state of total disconnection from God's light. Therefore, it brings complete darkness. We navigate between these two forces. When we are in the clutches of the desire to receive for the self alone, we veer ever closer to darkness. There, we feast on a steady diet of chaos and sickness and are finally sentenced to death. Three, we create our lives by whichever force we connect to. Ego action, which will take us to pain, suffering and death, or God action, which will take us to joy, fulfillment, life. There is a choice to be made at every moment. We have the power to choose our reality. Each moment we can connect in varying degrees to light and to darkness, depending on our actions. To the degree our actions connect to God, we will experience light and fulfillment. To the degree our actions connect to darkness and ego, we will experience pain. As we choose to move closer to the light, we will experience a greater degree of fulfillment and less pain. As we choose to move closer to ego nature and the absence of God's life, light, we increase our experience of pain and decrease our fulfillment. Those are our only choices. 4. We connect to the two forces through the law of similarity of form. We connect to and become what we become like. So, things of dissimilarity take us toward pain, suffering and death. Things of similarity, joy, fulfillment and life. We're accustomed to the idea of things being separated by space. On a deeper level, things are separated or connected by a similarity or dissimilarity of form. We're separated from God, for example, because we're not like him. We don't match his essence. He is an essence of sharing and ours is of receiving. According to the law of similarity of form, when essences match, the separation ends. This means that as our essence becomes more like God's essence, we move closer to being like God. Another way to say this is, we become like God by behaving like God. Number five, we become like God by systematically destroying the ego because the desire to receive for the self alone is the opposite of God. He does not receive from anyone. So now the circles change from being quite separate to having gradations of closeness or darkness or light Okay, as we re read these next two sections. Through a cosmic case of mistaken identity, we connect to the ego, to a dissimilarity of nature with God. The world has been carefully designed by the opponent for the care and feeding of that ego, the endless craving for respect, vanity, praise and flattery and the ceaseless indulgence of selfish desires. To achieve similarity of form to match God's essence, we must move wholeheartedly in the opposite direction to confronting, humiliating, embarrassing and purging that ego nature rather than propping it up and freeing ourselves from the need to indulge selfish desires until our essence 
finally becomes like God's essence. 6. We become like God by transforming into beings of sharing because God is a force of infinite sharing. When we have no sharing, our ego is in place and active. When we have infinite sharing, which is virtually impossible for humans to do, we are becoming like God. Desire to receive for the self alone is the opposite of God's nature, which is a nature of infinite sharing. By opposing this selfish desire and becoming beings of sharing, we match God's essence. Transforming into a being of sharing does not mean performing an occasional act of generosity. It mandates continual movement toward the light and a change of form to become a being in which every thought, every action and every utterance comes from the desire to share. This transformation in which sharing becomes a way of living, not merely an occasional act in which sharing is done when it is not easy or comfortable to share, bears a special name. It's called transformative sharing. The God Formula Through a dual process of eradicating the ego and performing transformational sharing, we awaken our true nature and become like God creating a life of total joy and fulfilment. So, we have three circles now. The dashed circle, you, the ego, and God. So, the circle that's dashed with the word you in it, minus the dark circle with ego written in it, plus transformative sharing, equals God. Wherever we can, we must take actions to destroy the ego. Conversely, we won't dread embarrassing and humiliating situations anymore. We will welcome them because they will help us destroy the ego and realise our true nature. Wherever we can, we share, especially when it's not easy or comfortable to do so. When we live as God, we realise God's nature in every cell and we eradicate the barriers between our true nature and ourselves. When we do not live like God, we live in separation, in ego nature, in the desire to receive for the self alone. Here each desire makes our separation more solid, sentencing us to pain, suffering and death. So we have a job to do in this physical realm, continually rooting out the desire to receive for the self alone. Moment to moment, in every moment of now, we must operate as beings of sharing. Our job is to become like God. Hmm, this is a big project, isn't it? It's called the Human Project. I think it's called that anyway. So we're up to Chapter 5, and I wasn't really going to read all of this to you today, but I'm enjoying it so much I'm going to keep going. Chapter 5, Your Life Changes Now. So now we know the formula. We're either heading toward life or we're heading toward death. Step by step, we'll either archive... Oh, sorry, <laughs> will either achieve complete and other utter connection with God and pain, suffering and death will disappear from the world, or we'll achieve complete disconnection from God and will die. So let me say that over again. We're either heading toward life or we're heading toward death. Step by step, we'll either achieve complete and utter, con utter connection with God and pain, suffering and death will disappear from this world, or we'll achieve complete disconnection from God and will die. Right now, this minute, as you read these words, you're either heading for eternal life or you're committing suicide. Ooh. I think I was committing suicide until I had my little crisis in Tuesday morning. But anyway, this realisation is not a paradigm shift. It's a paradigm shattering. And yet, given that you have found this book among millions of others and have accompanied me so far, chances are you know this is true. God exists and he would never consign the human race to endless suffering and an unavoidable death. Union with God is possible and, is cons and its consequence is never-ending joy and the removal of death. God does not suffer and die, therefore we don't need to suffer and die. So the only question is where to begin. We begin with ruthless honesty about our present state. Mm -hmm. We not, must... We must name the extent to which selfishness governs our every action. 
We must focus the truth upon ourselves and reveal that everything we do is born of selfish desire. The desire to receive for the self alone is in permanent on position. This is most true when we think we're acting selflessly. When we make a donation, help our neighbour, go the extra mile at work, pray for humanity in a place of prayer, what are we actually doing? We're trying to gain advantage for ourselves, or our agenda may be to feel good about ourselves. It may be to appear spiritual in the eyes of the world, but a pure gaze on our motives suggests our motives are really pure. The God formula is a two-tiered assault on the ego. The process of destroying our ego on the inside and performing transformative sharing on the outside. An assault with no rest, no compromise and one con constant litmus test. Am I God yet or am I not? The process of a d destroying ego is not a moral decision. It's a down-to-earth, hard-headed, practical decision because it leads to happiness and fulfillment. Transformative sharing does not come automatically. Rather, it violates our sense of entitlement. It is, so um, it is so contrary to our nature, in fact, that it changes our nature itself. Sharing and ego are inversely proportional, just as a wall and sunlight are inversely proportional. The more wall, the less sun. The less wall, the more sun. We share with others so we can truly give to ourselves. True Selfishness Kabbalists teach that the world was created with a single purpose to provide the Creator with an opportunity to share His abundance with His creation. With that purpose in mind, the Creator shaped vessels to receive that abundance. These vessels sometimes bear the name human beings. Yeah, we're vessels. Unfortunately, we vessels have underperformed in our promise. Uh oh. We were designed to become one with our Creator. We were built to hold an infinite payload of health, joy and life. Instead we contain a little health, a few infinitesimal drops of joy and about 75 years of pain and suffering. <laughs> instead, instead of being infinite, we're like thimbles in a vast ocean of life. What happened? We vessels, it turns out, were constructed with a defective material called desire to receive for the self alone. When the self is preoccupied with its own desires, obsessed, obsessed with its own survival, and driven by hunger for immediate gratification, the self becomes opaque to the Creator's light. We vessels fail, not because we want to receive, but because we want to receive so little. Mm -hmm. So the great Kabbalist Rav Ashlag said, there's nothing wrong with desire itself, it's just that the vessel we use to receive our desire is so limited. Consumed by ego, our desires are in fact not simply limited, they are harmful. We're like the child in the following story. A father and his young son were walking down the street. The boy was extremely agitated with his father, shouting, You're mean, Daddy. Give them to me. The father held his son's hand tightly and continued walking down the street without response. Finally, the boy was making such a ruckus and the father seemed so oblivious to his son that a passerby felt moved to approach the father and ask him why he treated his son so badly. Can't you see you're upsetting him? They complained. What kind of father denies a son in such distress? The father looked patiently at the passerby. You don't understand, he said. A few streets back, my son saw some brightly coloured pins in a shop window. He wants me to buy them for him so he can play with them. I've told him that the pins are dangerous for a child his age and he risks hurting himself badly. Transforming the desire to receive for the self alone into the desire to share is actually a supreme act of self-interest. As long as you spell self with a capital S. This is not the self that is the ego. The self that can only die. I mean the self that can become one with God, that allows his light to shine unobstructed forever. Because when you are one with God, you are like God, with all the rights and privileges of God. The rights of eternal life, the privilege of joy unlimited, the power to heal, to bless and to resurrect the dead. Within the fabric of the universe there is abundance. In every atom and every cell of life there is sufficiency. 
There's nothing wrong, immoral, or ungodly about self-interest, with a capital S. There's nothing bad about wanting to receive. In fact, the basic attempt to eliminate self-interest is simply one more trick of the ego. The very reason we pursue transformative sharing is to receive. The word Kabbalah, the source of this wisdom, means to receive. We connect to our godly nature in order to change our vessel into a cup with no bottom so we can receive endlessly. So a cup, that's a complete cup, is limited, can only hold so much. But us, we are trying to become like God, endless sharing and endless receiving, endless receiving for the purpose of sharing. A sage known as the Master of Kotzik used to tell his students, you want to know where God's light is? God's light is wherever you let him in. We don't need to pray to God or plead to God for his light. We just need to remove the walls we've built. The God formula is a bulldozer. Whoa. Welcome to the state of amnesia. You've been wandering in a desert. Years have passed and your body is caked with hot dry crust. You dream of cool water and fruit, but day after day you survive on nothing but cactus. Cactus in the morning, cactus at night. Then one day, a scout arrives with an amazing message. 20 miles away, there's an oasis with crystal clear waters, palm trees and dates. How do you respond? I know how I would. Well, there's only one sane response. You drop everything and in a nanosecond and race madly in the direction of the oasis. Nothing deters you. Nothing distracts you. Nothing fills your mind except images of soothing cool water and blissful shade. With this book, a scout is bringing you news of an oasis. Not only does it offer dates and palms, it holds out eternal joy and fulfillment. What is your response? Some will say that the scout's mistaken. He's probably seen a mirage. Others will be inspired, head for the oasis, and after a few miles, come upon a scrawny palm tree under which they will proceed to sit for years, insisting that it's the oasis. Others will gather and chat endlessly about the oasis over a nice cup of cactus. Others will claim cacti are the most delicious plants in the world, so who needs an oasis? Most everybody will soon forget that the word oasis was ever mentioned. What on earth is going on? The state of ego is a state of amnesia. We don't remember what we came here to do, to manifest our true nature and become like God. So we read something inspirational and are moved by it. Years later, we may stay, stumble upon it by accident and realize we'd totally forgotten about it. We pray or meditate or have life-changing experiences. We feel different. Then we don't. What's up? One moment we have a transformative experience and the next we're cursing the person who bumps into us in the street. Why? We forget because it's in our nature to forget. Years of living in a consciousness disconnected from God have piled on and covered us like a shell to the point where our godly nature now is but a pilot light flickering in the vast darkness of egotistic mechanical behaviour. Scary, huh? We need a plan to follow every moment of, our, moment of our lives. Right now, this instant, because the next instant we'll forget, and then we'll remember again. The God formula can't be just another thing we know. It must be remembered constantly with clarity. The assault on ego and the process of transformative sharing must become our operating system. OS God. A drop of being is worth a pound of knowing. Being is true knowledge, because knowledge without action has limited value. We begin to act. Where ego rises up, we destroy it. When we don't feel like sharing, we share. Each action gets us a little closer to the light, a little closer to becoming like God, a little further from death. And the most important truth of all is the fact that becoming like God is possible. We can do it. 
This is the simplest and most extraordinary truth. It is observed that we use only 4% of our brain on good days. Who knows how much of our heart and soul we're using? There's an oasis not far away, don't forget. And this book is a string tied around your finger, don't forget. And every time you don't forget, it gets a little easier to remember. Chapter 6. We're doing very well here. I'm impressed with myself and you. It's hanging in there. This is certainty. I think it is. We're becoming a bit more like, well, each other anyway. Chapter 6. And death shall have no dominion. There's a story from the Zohar told of the passing of a sage named Rav Yossi. From the moment of his death, Rav Yossi's small son was inconsolable, weeping on his father's bed, press pressing his mouth tightly to his father's mouth, barring anyone from getting near the great sage's body. Where is the justice? The little boy cried. I should have been taken in my father's place. Refusing consolation, he gripped his father tightly as if he believed his small thin arms were strong enough to resist his father's departure to the other world. He implored the heavens to take him instead, and his wails proved so moving that finally a visitor named Rav Elazar began to weep along with the child. He then recited a verse from the Bible. Suddenly a pillar of fire arose and separated the mourners from the dead man, though the child remained attached to the lips of his father. A voice then spoke to the dead sage, Blessed are you, Rav Yossi, that the speeches of the young child and his tears rose to the throne of the holy king. Twenty-two years have been added to your life, so you will have time to teach your son, the perfect and beloved, before the holy one, blessed be he. Then the pillar of fire vanished, and Rav Yossi opened his eyes. He saw his son, whose lips remained glued to his, and he heard Rab Elazar announce, Blessed is our lot that we have witnessed the resurrection of the dead. It is the final taboo, the unthinkable and undeniable, the universal solvent, death. Kabbalah comes to us from a world, from a world to come, inviting us to a new courage. Not the courage to die, the traditional measure of bravery, but rather the courage not to die, the courage to confront physical immortality. On what basis can we challenge the indisputable truth that we are born to die? We will swallow up death forever and God will wipe away the tears of all the faces, says the Bible. It's not possible to read this statement and remain calm. The Bible promises the death of death. Hmm. When Enoch passed on, the Bible says, he did not die. Rather, Enoch was no longer there because God had taken him, which for Kabbalah means he actually left the earth with his physical body, which did not die. The Bible also says Elijah did not die, but rather was elevated to the upper worlds with his body, rising up to heaven in a chariot of fire. It's all hard to believe, isn't it? We challenge the hegemony of death, on the basis of such statements in the Bible and truths revealed in the Zohar. The Zohar tells us that there are two poles, light and darkness. The light is God, eternal life and total fulfillment, and the darkness is ego or desire to receive for the self alone and is the force of death. When we choose to connect to darkness, we move closer toward death. When we choose to connect to the light, on the other hand, we draw down more and more life force. Our job is to travel to the light, and when we reach it, completely, when we become like God, death shall have no dominion. This is the end of death, not on the basis of belief or religious faith, or after an apocalypse. We need to make this happen ourselves. The wisdom of Zohar is here, not to strengthen a given belief system, but to inspire us to venture beyond belief to the realm of action, where the deepest human hope travels out of the realm of myth and into the realm of everyday life. Physical immortality is possible because we have the power to create it. And knowing that, we have a mandate to make it happen. It's said in the Zohar that one day Rav Yitzhak approached his friend Rav Yehuda with a request 
that after he, Rav Yitzhak, goes to his grave, his good friend should pray for him all the seven days of mourning. Astonished, Rav Yehuda asked why the master supposed he was going to die, whereupon Rav Yitzhak gave two reasons. First, when his soul left him during sleep, it no longer enlightened him with dreams. Second, he no longer saw his shadow. Once a man's shadow is no longer seen, he reminded his friend, he passes away from this world. Rav Yehuda replied, I shall carry out your request, but I also ask that you shall reserve a place for me beside you in the other world, just as I was beside you in this world. Distraught at the prospect of their imminent separation, the two friends finally went to see their master, one of the greatest Kabbalists in history and author of the Zohar, Rav Shimon Bar Yochai. Rav Shimon was on such a level in his own journey toward becoming like God that he simply lifted up his eyes and could see the angel of death dancing before Rav Yitzhak. He invited his two students into his home but refused entrance to the angel of death. Whoever is a usual visitor to my house shall enter, he said, and whoever is not shall be barred. Once inside, Rav Shimon stood up and said, Master of the universe, we have a certain Rav Yitzhak with us. Behold, I hold him. Give him to me. A resounding voice replied, Behold, Rav Yitzhak is yours. Rav Yitzhak fell asleep and in his sleep saw his father who proclaimed, Son, happy is your portion in this world and in the world to come, for you sit among the leaves of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. A sound went forth in all the worlds. Friends who stood here, bedeck yourself for Rav Shimon, who has asked a request of the Holy One, that Rav Yitzhak shall not die. And it was granted him. Rav Yitzhak then awoke and laughed. His face shone. If Kabbalist Rav Shimon, Shimon, sorry, if Kabbalist Rav Shimon Bayokai had the power to turn back the angel of death with a simple act of will, why do we invite death into our bedroom so willingly? Why is the inevitability of death off the table marked not for discussion? Simply because it has always been that way. Just because we've driven, sorry, just because we're driving through history with our eyes on the rearview mirror instead of on the road ahead. Life should come with the same legal disclaimer as financial advertising. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. <laughs> Turning points in history are nothing but the record of assumptions overthrown, a diary of impossibilities and those who rose up to accomplish them. At one time, one third of humanity died from viruses and bacteria. Today, bubonic plague is just a name for a hard, for a rock band. At one time, when oil lamps still burned, experts declared that everything that ever would, uh, everything that ever would be invented, had already been invented. Today, we take and send digital pictures with our cellular telephones. History is not kind to impossibility. However, impossible physical immortality might seem evolution will sweep that notion aside. I think that should read, however impossible physical immortality might seem, evolution will sweep that notion aside. Immortality will not simply happen because we build a time machine, develop stronger antibiotics or download our DNA onto hard drives. Immortality will happen because of our work of becoming like God and because we're already immortal. In our souls, we're already like God, but because we're set apart from God's nature of sharing, we suffer and we die. When we become like, when we become like God, we erase our own diseases transform everyday annoyances into opportunities to become free, dismiss the thoughts that cause depression with a wave of our hand, live with a grander purpose than surviving the prison another day, and become the cause of all our, all our experiences. We'll even, like Rav Shimon Bar Yochai, put up a no trespassing sign to the angel of death, so that from now until eternity, death shall have no dominion. Won't that be fun? Chapter 7 The Opponent The stuff that death is made of ooh, ooh, ooh. 
That's good. We need to know this so we can get rid of it. It's not us, it's him. He's a deadly parasite, a prison guard who prevails, not by putting us in a cell, but by putting himself inside us. He's a dark force moving inside our bodies, thinking inside our brains and commanding our actions endlessly, all with the aim of our total and absolute annihilation. We don't live. He lives us. Ancient Kabbalists called the opponent the evil inclination. Evil because of the ruthless campaign of confusion, forgetfulness, doubt, despair, with which he carpet bombs our souls. Wow. Evil because he hotwires us to the desire to receive for the self alone. Evil because he's a force pervading, pervading the universe at work 24-7 to block our true nature and imprison us in pain, suffering and death. Mm. We don't live, he lives us. The opponent has us convinced that we're free individuals, whereas 99% of our thoughts are his. He has convinced us that the ego self is our greatest friend, when in fact it's our fiercest enemy. He's the reason we live in what is external to our God nature, ego, rather than in our essence, which is the desire to share. So one day we're inspired by a piece of wisdom. It resonates deep within us like an ancient memory. We're intrigued, inquisitive. Then suddenly we remember a parking ticket we forgot to pay. Then we realize we're a little hungry and wonder if we should have a snack. In minutes we've forgotten the wisdom. This is no accident. It's not us, it's him. Then we remember, I could actually be free of suffering and death. We think to ourselves, then a voice inside says, don't be naive. It's not us, it's him. No one escapes. The conversation in our minds continue. Don't delude yourself. Life is suffering and then you die. Anyone who says differently is in it for the profit. You're depressed, but at least you're not a sucker. It's not us, it's him. This is a snapshot of prison life. This is the opponent hard at work, manning the gates. He lives in our bodies and we aren't even angry about it. Instead, we focus on looking good, not understanding that this desire makes us slaves to everyone who sees us. It's not us. It's him. We curse the driver who cuts us off at the intersection, not understanding that we're sacrificing our health, our sense of well-being on this morning of our lives to someone we've never met. It's not us. Who wants to yell from the car window? It's him! It gets worse. Desire to receive for the self alone means permanent war with the physical world. The opponent convinces us that we're entitled to comfort and then tells us we should be irritated when everything doesn't go our way. Again. It's not us. It's the opponent. We believe we're the active principle in our lives, but we're reacting constantly. We don't control. We are controlled. It's not us. It's him. And now we never need to be fooled again by anger or depression or fear because every time we're about to act or react, we'll ask, is it me or is it him? And we'll know it's us if it's moving us closer to becoming like God. Why do you ask my name? In the book of Genesis, Jacob wrestles with an angel who is the sum of all the negative energy in the universe. Jacob eventually defeats him, and as the angel begs for release, Jacob issues him a challenge. I'll let you go if you tell me your name. The angel replies, <clears throat> Why do you ask my name? It seems an innocent question, but when this question Kabbalists see, but it, within this question, Kabbalists see a secret to unraveling the power of the dark force. A person's name is his or her essence. When Jacob demands the angel's name, he's demanding to know his essence. What is the wellspring of the opponent's power? How is he so able to dominate people? If Jacob can understand his essence, he can defeat him. Why do you ask my name? The angel replies. And in that question, Kabbalists believe Jacob got his answer. His name is, why do you ask my name? That's his name. That's his essence. The power of confusion, the power to make people doubt, 
to question why they even bother to figure things out. Focus and clarity are the opponent's mortal enemies. We must fight for clarity every, every moment. Clarity about the importance of clarity. Clarity that we're in a prison. Clarity that there's a God formula to be applied. Clarity that we're destined to be like God. If life is asleep in us, courtesy of the sedative called desire to receive for the self alone, Jacob's tussle with the angel represents our struggle to wake up. Most of the time, whenever people are, have attempted to think clearly throughout history, the angel has wrestled them into submission. We live in the reign of confusion, presided over by the angel, why do you ask my name? One of his greatest allies is a principle of physical existence called the gap between cause and effect. There's no effect without a cause, and no cause without effect. And were there no gap between cause and effect, were we instantly to see the results of our actions, we'd see clearly what needed to be done. But the gap between cause and effect erects a wall of blindness between our selfish actions and the darkness that ensues. So, one morning we might be impatient with someone at work, no big deal. Two weeks later we wake up in a bad mood and wonder why. It's just my nature, we may say. I'm just an unhappy person. I need a double espresso. What we don't see is the correlation between an act of selfishness two weeks ago and a negative result this morning. Time doesn't heal all wounds. It just obscures their cause. If we could see that every action arising from the desire to receive for the self alone has a negative consequence, we'd arise from our slumber, we'd realise that our actions have consequences, as sure as the sun rises, and that we have the power to change those consequences. We have the power to be proactive, not reactive. Once we see the connection between actions and results, it becomes easier to change. With correlation comes correction, and with correction comes power. The opponent fears our power most of all, so he convinces us that we're insignificant. We just got a message that between cause, which is action, and effect, which is consequence, thick is a gap. Can be. Most often is. And what that's called is time. And we're given time to make a correction. In the reign of confusion with the angel, why do you ask my name, presiding on every corner, we must be steadfast in our desire for clarity and focus. Clarity and focus transform our actions. When we give charity for the purpose of being a good person, we feel good. When we give charity for the purpose of becoming like God, we become immortal. Such are the stakes of the battle. The opponent does not rest. He has no paid holidays. He never runs home to catch a must-see TV. Look up and he'll be there. So whatever victories we win, they're not opportunities to take a rest, but platforms from which to battle further. The name of death. Ego is the stuff of which death is made. Ego equals desire to receive, which equals death. Ego is the desire to receive for the self alone. A serpent bite that poured venom into Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and has flowed through human veins ever since. That is our foundation story, the angel of death convincing Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of knowledge. We carry the venom of the serpent, or ego, with us now. We are led along a path of more and more selfishness until things reach a critical mass and an angel bearing a new name shows up, the angel of death. We have completed, you have completed your journey to me, he says. Now you are mine. Ego is the energy of death. When we connect to the creator, we remove death from our lives. It begins by realising, by making real inside our beings, that every time we go after the, the desire to receive for the self alone, we are actually attracting death. When we see this as an absolute fact, we'll get closer to becoming like God. 
the opponent has prevented us from putting cause and effect together, the true correlation between what we do and what we experience, we don't see that the, that the desire to receive for the self alone leads to pain, suffering and ultimately death. This allows us to pretend that a selfish action has no consequence. The venom flows. We can choose the self alone every minute of every day for 80 years, millions of tiny decisions over a lifetime, and when our negativity has accumulated to a critical point, we die. Or we can start removing the venom, drop by drop. Chapter 8 Comfort Kills. Now I'm going to make a decision here about whether I continue or I don't. We have covered seven chapters in this little book. They're only short chapters, but they're powerful chapters. And we have a total of 12. So I have one, two, three, four, five more chapters to go. And then the epilogue. And I think. I might leave it there because the next chapter is called Comfort Kills and I need to go and get comfortable because this body is signalling a desire to receive for the self alone. Ciao.